Uh, my name is Jake Augustine. I'm part of the VMware Cloud Foundation Division at VMware by Broadcom, focusing on our go-to-market strategy. So show of hands, who was here for the last field day or has seen part of what VMware is doing in the private AI space? Okay, so about half the room, perfect. So I'm gonna go through a quick recap of kind of what we're doing, what we've, what we've launched this year, some announcements we made at the end of last year, and then give a basically a state of the business update into what we're doing and essentially what our customers are saying and what the feedback has been from, from some of our customers across the globe. So as a quick recap, we launched this at the beginning of uh, the summer, and that is our VMware Private AI Foundation with NVIDIA. So essentially in the market, as we went general availability and we've, we've had consuming customers today, our focus has been around enabling AI workloads across the enterprise and simplifying the way that those are deployed throughout the entire line of business, throughout the, all lines of business within the organization. We're gonna go through some examples and talk about where we've kind of seen AI workloads start and how that organically grows into larger and larger silos, but has struggled to scale and gain further adoption throughout those, some of those businesses. And then the way our, our, some of our executives within our customer base are looking at this is how do we accelerate this? And there's this very, very clear moment in time, I believe, in the AI ecosystem today that our customers are very intent on proving out their use cases, proving the investment they're making to justify the cost to move forward on some of these AI initiatives. So how quickly they can accelerate and bring that value back to the business is top of mind for most leaders that we talk to within our customer set. So as a quick recap for this, this is our solution at a high level overview. Justin, for those who can stick around in a little bit is gonna go into this more in depth, but what we're doing is taking the core product within VMware, which is VMware Cloud Foundation, and giving you optionality and choice both below the platform and above the platform. And that's gonna become very, very important as we start to talk about why this is resonating for our customers and the business challenges it's solved. So in partnership with NVIDIA, specifically NVIDIA AI Enterprise, we've done a lot of collaborative engineering work to take the NVIDIA software suite and bring it directly into our software suite, which is the blue layer, that is the private AI add-on that we layer on top of VCF. What this is doing is giving our customers a control plane that they know today from within VMware where they have historically delivered enterprise IT at scale through the last several decades and operationalizing the GPUs now within the data center in addition to giving them additional features that, that line of businesses care about for AI layers as well as data scientists to hit a lot of those accelerations and scales um, and enablement of security that we talked about. So if there's any specific questions on this, please let me know. Otherwise, as I mentioned, Justin and the rest of the team is gonna go into this a little bit more in depth, but we wanted to baseline and say, this is what we announced um, earlier this year, and this is what we're selling in the market today. Uh, two questions. Yeah. Is this only runs on um, NVIDIA certified uh, server hardware? That is correct. So there's three GPUs that we support today the A100, the H100, and the L40S, absolutely. So you have your choice of the OEM ecosystem, traditional hardware partners there at the, the Dell, HP, Lenovo, Supermicro, Hitachi, and Fast Technology Solution. And then NVIDIA has their certified stack with each one of those as well. But the specific GPUs that we support are those three that I mentioned. Uh, and I guess the other question is, so uh, VCF is a, is a package solution that has SDC and other things. Yep. Uh, is private foundation available as part of VCF or is it something you have to purchase outside of VCF? Yeah, great question. So VCF is that one package that you mentioned and then the private AI foundation, the blue layer, is the add-on to VCF. So it is just a core-based license that is additive to VCF. So it's additional? It's an uh, additional, yes, cost. Okay. Yep, yeah, good question. So, some of the, as we went to market with this, and even before when we started to talk to customers over the last several years, in addition to privacy, and we spent a lot of time at the last AI um, Tech Field Day talking about privacy, these are the additional challenges our customers wanted us to look at and say, you need to bring these into your solution because these are the things we're being faced with in the market. And fundamentally, as the way AI has boomed into generative AI, it's built on open source technologies, data scientists and lines of businesses, they want choice. Fundamentally, they want to be able to take something that's very, very new into the market, 
prove it out internally and deliver it as quickly as possible to the enterprise for everybody to consume. So choice and optionality above and below the platform is something that we sought out to deliver day one. What we're seeing is choice is really morphing into agility. So I think the last time we all talked to you about there's this huge dominance of large language models as there's been in this conversation for a very long time. And now we're seeing the entrance of smaller language models or micro language models in some instances. So the ability for a data scientist without having to strip down all the way to the bare metal and have agility on top of the platform gives them that choice as well on what they're choosing in this very vast ecosystem. Anytime you bring that amount of open source utilization or optionality into your environment, you have to be compliant with it. We've seen how cyber criminals embed themselves in some of these. This is the new threat vector. People tell them, customers say all the time, Jake, that's not new. People have been embedding cyber criminals inside open source forever. The adoption of AI has obviously accelerated that. So to be able to take some of these models, put them into a registry-like instance and deliver these throughout the enterprise that have gone through InfoSec or a security process gives you that level of compliancy that, that the enterprise IT has to deliver. Performance, we baselined a lot of this in the last conversation using things um, within that's been inside vSphere and VMware Cloud Foundation forever. We're giving you the same level of performance, if not better at times, based on our scheduling and orchestrator. But the cost and the, and the choice are the, the two that are, we're really gonna drill in today in the next couple minutes. Cost is, very, is variable in two different scales. Number one, if you go do AI in the hyperscaler, that's a token-based approach. Anytime you go there or you point someone, your internal customer to that URL, they are burning through your tokens. You bring that methodology and deliver that workload on premise, you have a fixed cost-based approach. Meaning, in a token-based approach, or I don't own the assets, every time I deliver and point someone to that URL or that API that sits outside of my domain, it's costing me money. And as it scales, as the users and the applications begin to scale, you're gonna see linear growth in the way that cost is driven. When you bring it on prem and have a fixed asset, now you're actually driving down the total cost of ownership. It's not a ROI conversation, is this must, what's the total cost to deliver this throughout the enterprise? And as our demand scales, how do we ensure that cost is either flattened or predictably scalable? So these are things that our customers have very much said need to be top of mind and we believe we're delivering inside this solution. So as I mentioned, we went journal availability in July. We have first, our first set of customers consuming the platform. We have a very healthy pipeline going into our Q4 and Q1. And these are some of the use cases that we're seeing from our customers and why this platform-based approach is resonating with them. Number one is time to value. Our very first customer, which would be in the financial services space, spent a lot of time trying to get two things going inside their environment. Number one was RAG. How do you build out even an entry-level RAG application that your customers internally to IT can start testing and validating to prove to deliver to the line of business. Due to resource constraints and a lot of other things that they had going, that took them a long time to do. The other thing that took them a long time is getting all the drivers associated with their um, GPU cluster constantly at a ready state and production level and make sure everything was patched and compliant for the organization. When they deployed our platform, they delivered RAG internally in two days and what they had spent several weeks trying to get drivers corrected, we actually addressed that within three hours. So the time to value and how quickly you can start utilizing and distributing the GPUs as an AI resource within your data center is, is probably one of the better talk tracks and the feedback we get from customers, which is why this is resonating for them. The stabilization of sprawl is a very, very interesting conversation and one that we hear from, from probably our largest customers across the globe. As we all know, AI really started at the data science layer when it was called machine learning. Now it's AI, it's generative AI. And those tools were traditionally used for analytics and performance testing, but basically a baseline of what never really grew over the last 15 years using it for analytics and things like that. As the predominance in the market, and you can't go into an airport anymore, you can't even get on an elevator without someone talking about generative AI. Now all of a sudden we see all these lines of, lines of business leaders asking to leverage AI and to get access to these resources. Data scientists have never had to deliver for scale or operational efficiency as you grow. So there, now we're seeing all these additional silos and pockets grow up as we bring in new models of hardware, new large language models, new third-party tools, 
And so stabilizing what is the new wave of IT sprawl inside of an environment to say, we can put this on a single platform where all we have to do is focus above the platform with these new tools, what we have common tool sets underneath, that is incredibly important to our largest customers and the leaders inside of IT because you're stabilizing where this is and you have visibility into this organic growth inside your environment. So cost and resource planning kind of goes into that exact same concept. So as I have all these different environments being spun up, what is my visibility into that? The, the thing we see in the life of a data scientist is today they need three GPUs, at the end of the week they need six, and the next week they need four. That type of underutilization and constant change drives up the total cost for our customers because you're never 100% utilizing a GPU or the resource in which the GPU sits. So by being able to deliver that workload virtualized or attach that a workload to that virtualized environment, we, not, we have much better visibility into the cost and planning that it takes to take, bring in the next workload or the next application because we're delivering performance and giving visibility across the entire enterprise, this is no longer just a siloed project where GPUs are tied to single applications or single teams. A common tool set for the enterprise is something that we're seeing more and more. So as, as I mentioned, the demand is to bring this into the enterprise and think about scale throughout an entire organization. Most of our largest customers have anywhere between a 12 to 30 lines of businesses inside some of their, their um, large organizations. So when you say, now we need to deliver these, the AI teams are being asked to hand this off to IT. IT knows VMware. They know the constructs of VCF. They know how to deliver a VM. So now you put a container inside a VM that is AI enabled. It gives where the, the workloads are being handed off to, it gives our IT teams this very common tool set that they've known for two, two decades to now go deliver these workloads at scale. Hey Jake, uh, yeah. originally when private AI was discussed probably last year uh, before GA, there was both a reference architecture version and a uh, NVIDIA solution yes. version. The reference architecture still exists? Is that something that you still Yes, uh, absolutely. Yep, absolutely does. And that was all based on public domain, open source yep. solution software, and things of yep. that nature. And the NVIDIA solution, do you actually, I, obviously you purchase the NVIDIA hardware separately and you, you purchase the servers through one of the various OEMs that supply NVIDIA certified servers. Yep. Uh, but do you pay for the stack, for the NVIDIA enterprise software stack on top of private AI? Yes, so you would get just the VMware components from VMware or one of our distribution reseller partners and NVIDIA sells everything through the channel as well. There are certain GPUs, the H100 PCIe GPU comes with NVIDIA AI Enterprise. So that is okay. packaged together, but that is the only one from NVIDIA that comes pre-packaged as a bundle. Otherwise, to your point, yes, you're buying the hardware independently from the software. Independently from private AI yeah. uh, software on top yep. of VCF. Yep. And Absolutely. there's been a, a discussion back channel here. Um, does it require the use of vSAN storage or could you use external storage, primary storage from other vendors and things of that nature? Yeah, our recommendation is vSAN storage because it comes inside VCF. And again, it's really going to drive down that cost, but we have a variety of different external storage partners that are certified for not only VCF and, and they ask about private AI as well. So they support that fully as a as a yes yeah yep okay so you can use outside storage as the the core storage for VCF now because originally you needed to have a vSAN environment just the core storage of the VCF environment and then you could attach outside storage so you're getting vSAN with VCF so yep, but you don't actually have to use it yeah the question I guess do you actually have to use it for at least a portion of the storage or not. I don't think that you have to use it for a full portion of the storage because we, we've been asked a lot that from an external perspective, but Justin can, Good who's up here after me, yeah. can kind of drive Good. into that. Yeah, absolutely. So. so vSAN is required for the management cluster. So VCF has two different clusters, management and workload domains. So for the management clusters, vSAN is required. But for your workload domains on which the GPUs are installed, you could use any other core storage that you have. I'll okay. show a picture of that coming up. <laughs> And in this uh, example, uh, if someone was uh, previously familiar with it, licensed to VCF, um, uh, went through a life cycle with it, are there any elements or SKUs that they would need to be aware of that are separate and apart from VCF? 
Um, so if you're if you're on you're talking if you're on legacy VCF, can you Correct. can you Correct. come right into this? Correct. So as long as you're on version five point one point one, you can put private AI on, private A on top of that. But as okay. far as going from what was our perpetual licensing into our VCF subscription licensing? Yeah, as long as you're on five five one, then you, you can go deploy this on top of All that. All right, so five five one train. You have this now as an option that yep. you can add into your environment. Yep. Um, when that takes place, and I'm assuming there's like a full hardware compatibility list. And Absolutely. Yep. So, so how are you guiding or advising for like if a customer does want to go down that path? Are you leading that exchange? Are you talking? about what NVIDIA's capabilities are? Are you reliant on NVIDIA to have that conversation? Tell us about how- Yeah, the kind of the go-to-market, how we're kind of surrounding our I customers. I think you had said that. earlier that you were in the go-to-market, so I think yeah, that might be Yeah, the great question. Yeah, that's, that's one I can absolutely fully address. So um, it's, that's where the conversations get really, really interesting with customers. What we've seen is a lot of customers say, I have, I have this specific set of large language models I'm using. How do I bring that into your environment? That's a very determined ecosystem, and we can absolutely make hardware recommendations okay. on that because I, they've already engaged with NVIDIA. They've already engaged with the OEMs. And by the way, the OEM partners, the NVIDIA partners, they're driving a lot of this conversation. Okay. When you get into our largest customers, which is where we're really stabilizing straw, straw and doing a lot of cost basis, and they say, hey, we have new workloads, or a customer who's just trying to come into this space and deliver AI, um, at a different entry point than some of those monolithic teams, that's where we absolutely bring NVIDIA into the conversation. Okay. We are virtualization infrastructure, they are the AI company. So if you say, here's the outcome I want, help me define what large language models I should use, those sorts of things, we can provide guidance, but the real in-depth is when VMware and NVIDIA are meeting our customers together. And in that situation, is that a, are, you, are, are you bringing an opinion from the VMware side? Oh, yeah, the best thing I love about VMware post-acquisition is we're full of opinions. Okay. Yeah, absolutely we are, for sure. We have a very, um, I think you heard from one of them in our in our This last is the softball session. portion of your talk. Right? Yeah, yeah, yeah. You heard from Sean in our last session. Yeah, Sean's been doing this, and Justin's been doing this and for the better part of the last decade. So at a lot of these conversations, we absolutely have an opinion. Okay. You know, most of our use cases that our customers talk to us about are the same that you all are probably seeing. It's a chat bot. It's code generation. It's get driving down contact center uh, time and dwell time. It's, it's getting that from, hey, we're sitting there for five and a half minutes. How do we go down from five minutes? That's going to save us millions of dollars throughout the year. So those types, we've seen enough of that prevalence to very have a very definitive opinion on how that should go. Thanks. Yeah, for sure. Any additional questions about where our customers are resonating, what this is doing? There's several large engagements that we have um, across the globe where these are the common themes that we wanted to share and bring forth for you all as an update based on what we're doing after general availability. Yeah, you know, I talked to a lot of large customers and they, they um, if they've been in the AI space for a while, they already have AI dedicated AI clusters that are sitting yep. there with the GPU hardware and stuff. And how do you, how do you convince them to bring some of that under your, your solution? I guess the question, because yeah. these guys, you know, that, that, that pretty much, that it's siloed, right? I mean, the AI group Huge is silo. one group and the IT group is another group and don't necessarily talk to one another. Yeah, I would say there's there's really two paths. There's the one path where the customers have said, hey, we train this model, this is our model. We have a few variations of that very expensive model we took to create. That's gonna remain within this within this team. What happens when that path, it's not us convincing that specific team, like, hey, you should virtualize this. It's typically an executive coming in and saying, how are we going to deliver this? Who are you handing it off to? Um, we are seeing customers are not adding a ton of resources to data science teams because this has been become more of a commoditized conversation. So passing off the delivery and the, and the scale to the IT team, we're not having to convince our customers to do that. The executive leadership is convincing them to do so, that. So you're really more of a an inferencing Avenue for scale and that sort of thing. Yeah. So you you know the customer would train wherever he wanted to yep. train it. He'd get it rock rocking and rolling, and he'd move the model over to the private AI foundation as an inferencing. Yep. Architect. But it's the second path where it's it's a lot cleaner. If you haven't spent a lot of time in your own environment doing a bunch of the really deep deep learning, that is not first of all that's not the workload that we're going after. You're going to probably do that on bare metal today or some kind of super pod or 
perhaps in a hyperscaler, because that also doesn't take as long as for organizations as they initially thought. The other path is we're getting into this. It hasn't grown. Like we, we don't have a big, huge team with millions of dollars resources invested into it. So it's much easier to go onto a platform-based approach. Uh, when you mentioned platform, Based yep. approach. What are you really saying? I mean, I, just like the twelfth time I've heard this. This is a great point, right here in the time to value. Everybody that thinks they're doing AI believes they're spending all their time at the AI application layer. So essentially, what I would describe as above the platform. What we're actually finding is they're spending an inordinate amount of their time at the infrastructure layer. They're actually trying to build infrastructure to support AI. But as quickly as AI is changing, and this goes back to your the previous question you had right there, how do you respond to a customer that has a bunch of AI workloads already running today? Look at large language models. Those have significantly changed over the last 12 months. So we're not having to convince our customers to say, hey, there's a bunch of new large language models or small language or micro language models. How are you adapting to that? Because customers are telling us, we're not gonna have a dozen language models, we're gonna have hundreds of them. So you have to have this platform-based approach we have a large federal customer that they came in and said, hey, can you help us with code generation? What we very, very quickly found is you're just spending all your time building infrastructure. And every time you're trying to change whatever tool you're using, you're having to rebuild the infrastructure up. That is taking you weeks to go and do that. So if we deliver a virtualized platform, your entire focus now can actually be at the AI layer, which is the application, not the infrastructure. It allows rep repurposing. Of Absolutely. The yeah, it, you're driving straight back in their cost and capacity plan. They want a cartridge. They want to, you know, like they're going to have many, many cartridges, and that's how they want to treat. Yep. It. They don't want, uh, they don't want uh, bespoke snowflake. Absolutely. Not, not any more than they have to have. Yep. Yeah. Okay. So when your customers are are using this for inference, what do they do from a training perspective? Right. I mean, if if everything is based on the NVIDIA AI enterprise, it does both. Yep. Right? So if you focus on the inference side and people want to go end-to-end. And, and and what do you see then customers typically using for training, and how can that be helpful reusing some of the infrastructure they're using on, in, on the inference side? So uh, we see a lot of training done in like DGX or the DGX cloud that sits inside the hyper, hyperscaler. So you, you don't go put this software layer on top of that, right? Uh, Th those are not virtualized platforms right. from VMware today. So then you would say, hey, I've got the model, I've done the training I wanted to do, I'm going to pull it into this platform. And I think Justin's going to talk about some new updates that we have from a, what we call model gallery for large language right. models. But then you can start inferencing on top of the platform. Right. So, so if I can translate that, so you're kind of using the models in a black box format where you have a library of models, yeah. but you don't necessarily know how people build the model. You just know it's available. Yep. And we don't, yeah. And we, by the way, it's not just, we can use third-party models, we use NVIDIA models, right. we use any ecosystem model, absolutely. It doesn't matter to us which model you use. All right, so when you talk about cost and capacity planning, that's independent of what happens on the training side, right? Yeah, I would say that's a fair way to look at it. Right, because if you use it as a black box, you have no idea how much time, what infrastructure, where it was built, and maybe you don't care, right, from a customer perspective. Yeah, I. I don't care, and I, I would tell you, I don't think our customers are, well, I don't think. I know our customers are not doing as much deep learning and training as they did a year and a half ago. Right. Yeah. There's just so many more community models out there, and you can begin, begin, begin doing RAG to take your enterprise data, and now you're making that. And it's not just proprietary to my business as a holistic organization. It now becomes proprietary to an individual line of business because finance is going to have a completely different demand than, say, research would. Yeah. So, I mean, the RAG aspect of this would be relatively straightforward on private mm -hmm. AI. I guess the question is, do, would you see fine-tuning activities on private AI? Absolutely. Uh, but, you know, deep learning, training, vast thousand server, 8,000 GPU complexes, you're not seeing that on private No, AI. I mean, we've been doing, we've been doing, virtualization inside HPC for a while. Um, so we still see it, but that's not really the, I mean, I wouldn't go do it if it was me, no. Yeah. yeah. So, uh, question that I, I'm not sure has quite come out yet is that, so you're talking about the applications that they're running. So um, it ha happens to be an AI-based application. There's, there's a model which is some fancy maths. 
um, and I've got an application that uses the fancy maths to do inferencing largely from what we're doing. So I can change whatever the maths is for the model, but the application itself is making use of model-based software. So someone is writing this software, and if they are, so who is writing that software, and how are you getting them to write it so that it works for VMs? Because I I know from a bunch of customers who are using other techniques for it, and it's the classic problem of yeah we built it over here in a silo and we used Kubernetes and yep. containers and a whole bunch of stuff, and then we come to central IT who don't know how to drive Kubernetes because they're on VMware and yep. say this is yours now enjoy. Yeah, this is one of the great parts of a recent update we did with VMware Cloud Foundation. So we take and deliver Kubernetes. We can do. We can take the container. We can do it on a VM. But we absolutely can now deliver that. And again, if if the customer wants it in a container, IT can now deliver it through a container inside of a VM. It, it's that is built into VCF. Um, the, it's uh, the VCF. I, I, I can't remember the acronym, but Justin will follow up on it for you. But, thank you. But now we can bring that in. And to your point, they're going to be built in containers. That's how most legacy siloed, they're, they're solving for that automation layer using containers. We can deliver that inside BCF. Okay. So there's not a lot of porting or having to have the people, the people who are writing the applications don't have to write. No, the API, API and it's they open underneath, for, absolutely. I'll okay. speak to that a little bit in my section. Am I out of time probably? No, you're not, okay. plenty of time. Okay. But the NIM component that you see in the top left hand side obeys OpenAI's API. Okay. And that's becoming the de facto standard for using model. You can use that against the NIM okay. with your own model. And where that question becomes extremely important to us is if we look out probably a year and a half from now, for most, for most of our customers, a lot of customers are not running a bunch of application, AI-enabled applications in production. But when you go do that, and now you have thousands of connections to various lines of code or different large language models, and that application is now production ready, you have to have, again, to the platform, you need this stabilized platform that's virtualized so we can handle resource and allocation of resources. Because if you have a failure in the GPU and the application is tied to a single subset of GPU and you haven't a plan for tolerance or high availability, your application comes down, which is, absolute, which is why everybody went to containers for public-facing production-level applications. So you have this complete full circle. I don't think we're quite there in the market, but it's some of our more advanced customers, especially at the executive level, are saying, okay, when I roll these into production, if I've done this in a silo, how am I counting for high availability and resiliency? Yeah. Well, the, this is only a problem if your AI initiatives succeed, and most of for them are sure. So only a few of them are actually succeeding. Yeah. When there's more of that, a successful application spends most of its time in maintenance mode, and that's largely what you're, I think, what you're the benefit of having this is your IT team already knows how to maintain this sort of infrastructure. Yes. And so we can already do that. So you don't have to learn how to operate and maintain Absolutely. a new kind of infrastructure just because you're doing some AI stuff. Yeah. You can, you're trying to make it as easy as possible for customers to just do what they're already doing, but a little bit more, it's just a new kind of workload. Yeah. Okay. We sat in front of a very very large R&D customer at uh, our VMworks 4 was a couple couple weeks ago, and their data science uh, person explained all these open source tools. I mean, they were sitting in front of us uh, in a table, and they explained like 30 to 40 different tools they had. I said, so what's the challenge that you're having? Like, wh what are you solving for? You're telling me all this brilliant work you've done. And he said, well, I can't do this anymore. I have other things I need to go do. I need to hand this off to the IT team. And the VP of IT is saying, is sitting there and is like, we have no idea how to run these tools. We know VMware. So exactly what you're describing, that's the reality of what our customers are facing, is moving this into an actual enterprise applicable use case.